Hare Krishna. It's wonderful to be here. All of you after almost two years. And uh, <laughs> so today it's a very auspicious day. The day of the disappearance of Srila Prabhupada. And today I will speak about how Srila Prabhupada has blessed all of us. Broadly, there are three kinds of people. I talk about how Srila Prabhupada integrated all these three kinds of approaches to life. There are traditionalists, there are existentialists, and there are utopianists. And Srila Prabhupada was a transcendentalist who integrated all these three approaches. Now these words might seem a little bit, but the concept is very simple. So basically, life is tough. <laughs> so many problems come upon us from expected ways and even more from unexpected ways. And everybody tries to find how to deal with these problems. So the traditionalist holds that the past has all the answers. If we just look in the tradition, oh, the people in the past were much wiser than us. And if you just turn to them, they can give answers to all our problems. The existentialists hold that the present is the key. So the past is already gone, don't worry about it. The future, we don't know when it will come, how it will come, whether it will come. Just live in the present. That is the existentialist. And the utopianist is, they have the idea that the future will be bright and wonderful. And work to create that wonderful future. So some people live for the past, some live for the present, and some live for the future. So these are traditionalists, existentialists, and utopianists. Utopia is like an imagination. Utopia is like a future fantasy that life will be so wonderful in the future. Now, the Prabhupada, he also came to guide us for how to deal with life's challenges. He was a transcendentalist. Now, the answers don't lie in the past, nor in the present, nor in the future. The answers lie in transcendence, in a reality beyond the material. And when we approach that reality, and then we can draw the best from the past, the present, as well as the future. Traditionalists, let's look at these and we'll see how, what is good about traditionalism and what is bad. And like that for all the three approaches. And we'll look at how Shri Prabhupada adopted the good while keeping aside the bad. So some people say that traditionalism, oh, in the past things were so good. And in the past people, people were more more moral, people were more close to each other, families were more integrated, life was so good. Now, if people think traditional, traditional is very good. Now, it is true in some ways, things in the past were good. But, this world is always a tough place. And the things are always wrong. In the past, there are so many discomforts at the physical level. When it's cold, there's no heating, there's no transportation as we have it, no telecommunications. Nowadays, for most young people, they think the past is terrible because there's no entertainment, no TV, no, no anything. How could people live? Life would be so boring. Actually, it is, we have so much entertainment and still we are bored. <laughs> So, in the past, people knew how to get joy in the simple things of life. But now we have so much razzle-dazzle, so much entertainment, and then slowly we become deadened to all that. So, yes, there is a lot we can learn from the past. Uh, the virtue of simplicity. That's one thing we can learn from the past. The importance of living close to each other, close to nature, and ultimately close to God. That's important. But in the past, at the, at the physical level, there were a lot of hardships. And not only at the physical level, there was, there was discrimination of various kinds. 
is India caste discrimination was there, and there was there racial discrimination, there was exploitation. So many things were always going on. So the traditionalists they believe that we can just turn the clock back. If only we could turn the clock back, and we could go. Maybe some people say the 15th century, some people say the 7th century, some people say the 5,000 years behind, and then we will be happy. But first of all, we can't turn the clock back. And even if we turn the clock back, there are so many things which we who have grown up in today's world, even if we were transported to that age, we wouldn't be able to live because we have grown up with a certain way of thinking, certain way of living. So Shri Prabhupada was in that sense a realist. He drew extensively from tradition. He spoke based on scriptures which were given thousands of years ago. But Prabhupada time and time again emphasized that this is not that what he is giving is not just traditional, it is transcendental. Transcendental means Srila Prabhupada did not try in any way to actually simply replicate what was done in India in the West or anywhere else in the world. Because each culture is different. Like some people have the idea. When, now definitely, the wisdom that we are trying to live according to, the devotion that we are trying to inculcate, all this was there in the past. Much more than what it is today. But Shri Prabhupada knew that transplant, when we want to tra transmit a tradition, it's not just a transfer, it's a transplantation. Transplantation means that it's like a, if a particular a particular plant is growing in India and then we bring it to America and want it to grow over here. We have to consider how it will grow over here. Exact same process over there might not apply. Many of us may grow Tulsi. I think in, here in Florida, the weather is reasonably good. So does Tulsi grow naturally here? Yes. yes, but if you go to the other part, maybe Chicago or Canada, it's a big effort. So when we transplant, we want the same purpose. That is, we want say the plant, the tulsi to grow. But the process may vary. If sometimes you may need a greenhouse over here, you may need a, a, a lights over here so that there's enough sun, whatever. So should the, Prabhupada, the traditionalists are, this is what was done in the past, this is what you should do. But Prabhupada was not like that. Prabhupada was resourceful. And the first thing that one of the first things that Srila Prabhupada did, it is amazing if you read. Shri Prabhupada's Leelamrita, it is a magnificent six-volume biog biography of Shri Prabhupada, describes the first few months when he was in America, you know, he stayed at the house of Gopal and Sally Agarwal. They had sponsored him. And the Sally Agarwal says that Prabhupada was so interested in everything American. He said, right from how the vacuum cleaner worked, how we used the fridge, what all we did. So now, Shri Prabhupada is infatuated with America. Not at all. He, when he had come to America, at that time, the first thing he saw, he composed a beautiful poem, Markine Bhagavad Dharma. And if you want to understand the heart of Shri Prabhupada, that is a that is a poem which you can read and meditate. Shri Prabhupada is all alone on the ship Jaladuta beholding the American coastline. And at that time, he sees this big building, smooth roads, fast cars. And for most people from the third world, uh, India is, was definitely at that time a part of the third world. Now it's slowly emerging. But for them, India is the land of the dreams. And you know, when Prabhupada saw America, at that time, what did Prabhupada say? He says, Rajasthamo guna hai rasa bai acha Vasudeva kat jena hi se prasad He said, this whole place is covered by the modes of passion and ignorance. Rajasthamo guna hai rasa bai acha So passion is where people are very impulsive. It's running around, hyperactive and impulsive. And ignorance is where people are very passive and apathetic. Just not doing anything. Or the active that is disrupting. So Prabhupada says, 
আছে কিছু কার্য তবে এই জানো মানে না হে কে নো আনি না এই অগ্রস্থানে but you know you must have some purpose that's why you brought me here otherwise why would you bring me to this terrible place ugrastane now i think in the history of the world nobody from india would have come to an america and said this is a terrible place <laughs> <laughs> this is a wonderful place a dream place about 25 years ago when i had just completed my engineering studies i was supposed to come to america i had done do gre had done quite well and got admission to some good universities also but somehow krishna and prabhupad's mercy came in my life and i was supposed to come here for for higher education but by prabhupad's mercy i got the opportunity to get the highest education <laughs> the, the study of the bhagavad gita raj vidya raj gita so then many of my relatives were really disappointed they said you have wasted your life <laughs> you lost an opportunity to go to america <laughs> then about 6 7 years ago first time when i came to america then when i went back my many of my relatives have not even talked with me for 20 years they called me says you went to america now your life is successful <laughs> <laughs> so, so nobody any person who comes to third world they don't think of america as a ugras man terrible place so wonderful place so prabhupad was not infatuated by america definitely not but when i was prabhupad so interested in everything american because prabhupad would try to understand how america works how american people think how american people live because he was planning to transplant he was planning to transplant the tradition and for that he had to understand how people were so Prabhupada was very interested in understanding so one of the most important things is when we are trying to share krishna consciousness with others uh, it's people need to feel understood before they become ready to understand like suppose you are sick and you go to a doctor we sit in the doctor's chair and the doctor starts firing a prescription hey, i didn't tell you my problem so no no i already know your problem just take this <laughs> now, even if the doctor's prescription is right we would have the confidence that they know it so similarly for people who are traditionalists for them if they want to share they want to preach so the word preach has a slightly negative connotation so preach is like holier than thou kind of attitude i'm going to preach to you i was in texas a couple of years ago and i saw a slogan on a person's car like a bumper car sticker says oh god please save me from your preachers <laughs> <laughs> god normally saves us through his preachers but the preachers are holier than thou condescending hell and brimstone kind of they don't want anything to do with these people so <laughs> that is the image that many people have of preachers so that's why using the word sharing krishna consciousness not preaching and then when we have to share krishna consciousness some people have the idea that is like a one formula just download that formula on everyone <laughs> like do this do this do this yes there is a prescription but we have to understand so traditionalists they think this is what was done if only you do this and all problems will be solved but life is not that simple life is not that simple the exact same way in which we grew a plant in india if we try to grow it in america it will die we do everything same like in medicine it is said operation successful patient dead <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> The traditionalists have this idea. This is what is all done. This was what was done. This is how it should be. That is all. No questions asked. But Prabhupada was not like that. Prabhupada understood how. What do people think? How do people live? And Prabhupada accordingly adapted. He was resourceful. Among the many adaptations that Shri Prabhupada did, was one of the most prominent was that he he gave everybody a sense of belonging and worth. when shri prabhupada later went back to india in the 1970s he got two big busloads of devotees with him from america 
it is a victorious return and for Vrindavan, Prabhupada had stayed in Vrindavan for a long time. Vrindavan is, at least at that time, it had a small town charm. Now it has become a little more commercialized. So for the Brajvasis, it was like, uh, Prabhupada was like their hometown boy. He has become famous. He has come back. So they organized a big festivity in the honor of Shri Prabhupada. Now there were many other saints over there, some of the Prabhupada's god brothers and others. Somehow, for them, Prabhupada had been like a junior god. <laughs> and they somehow couldn't digest that Prabhupada had become so famous and got so many disciples. And one of them said, well, so there was a celebration for felicitating Shri Prabhupada for having made so many people from the West, from America, from UK into Bhakti Yogis, into devotees. So one of the Prabhupada's god brothers said that actually Bhakti Ranan Swami was a businessman earlier. As a businessman, he interacted with all different kinds of people and he knew how to deal with people and that we had these skills of business and organization and it's, and using those skills, he has preached and he has built this school. It's wonderful that so many people have become devotees. So as far as we are concerned, now we were, uh, we were, we, we were Naishitik Brahmacharis. We took sannyas when we were young. And we never interacted with uh, with low class people, and we lived purely. It's it's good that all people from here are coming and learning about the glory of Vrindavan. So there is something called damning by faint praise. You praise suppose suppose somebody cooks food for you, and then they ask they ask how is the food? It is edible. <laughs> So, <laughs> now, edible is not itself a criticism, but it's such a faint praise that edible, <laughs> it comes up as a criticism. So, what they were doing over here is, saying Prabhupada, he was, he was a businessman, he engaged with materialistic people who are all impure. And he was able to mix with all these impure hippies and he made them into devotees. We are loot pure. Now, that might seem they're like a subtle put down of Shri Prabhupada. But what they misunderstood was that it's Prabhupada, it was not because of his business experience or his organizational skills. It was because of his purity. So there might be a doctor who stays in a hospital always, and whoever comes to the hospital, they try to treat and cure. There's another doctor who goes to the epidemic hit zone. And there the doctor tries to treat people. Now, all the apparatus, that is infrastructure, technology that is available for the doctor in the hospital, very little of it may be available for the doctor on, on site. And if the doctor on site is able to treat, that actually speaks of the glory of the doctor. So, Srila Prabhupada was like that. Srila Prabhupada went to the field and his outreach was, he made everyone feel included. From the Indian perspective, uh, the hippies would have been considered to be very, very degraded. In fact, from the traditional Indian perspective, people who live in the West are considered degraded. But the hippies were considered degraded by even those who were living in the West. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shri Prabhupada went among them, lived among them. Prabhupada, in the, in the early days of the movement, Shri Prabhupada would actually, they would just come, they would... Uh, Prabhupada would cook food, they would eat food, and they would just go away. They would think it's like a hot hotel. And Prabhupada would wash their plates. So Prabhupada served them. And it was his great compassion. So A, Prabhupada's idea of preaching was that, you know, I'll sit on a big seat and everybody come and hear from me. It wouldn't have worked that way. And Prabhupada never made anyone feel, feel impure. Although he did talk about standards of purity, about practice, practices that will bring about purity. But he did not ever make anyone feel looked down upon. Prabhupada valued everyone. People who were who were who were looked down upon by society. Even people who were traditionally would have been considered low born. Whether there was no caste discrimination, there was no birth discrimination, there was no gender discrimination. Prabhupada felt made everyone included. He engaged everyone. 
So Prabhupada was giving the teaching from the tradition. But he gave it in such an expert way that he was not simply a traditionalist. He's not that just the tradition's formula, just impose it. He looked at Tadesha Kala Patra at time, place, circumstances and expertly he taught. And it was because of that expertise that he attracted so many people. So, oh, I'll come, come to this metaphor at the end of transplantation once again. So the first is that we have to learn from the tradition, but we have to also learn from the contemporary situation about how to apply the tradition. So Prabhupada was a transcendentalist who, who took the tradition and applied it in the contemporary situation. And that's the Prabhupada, not just a transcendentalist who said that the past has all the answers. What is the second category of people? Existentialists. They say uh, that the present is what you should do. Present is what you is all that is important. And it is quite common. Now many people say live in the present. Live in the moment. Now yes, it's good because our mind wanders into the past and laments about the past, our mind wanders into the future and worries about the future. So yes, it's good to live in the present. But we don't live for the present. We live for something bigger than the present. At a very simple level, if somebody is sick and is in pain, you tell them live in the present. <laughs> the present is miserable. I want the present to end as quickly as possible. <laughs> so we human beings, yes, we have to live in the present in the sense that we have to deal with the present. And we can't be absent-minded uh, or the past, thinking about the past and the future and not be attentive to the present. But the existentialists are those who say that actually existence, whether it has any meaning or not, we don't know. So just live the best you can right now. So existentialists often avoid the big questions of life. Does life have any meaning? Does life have any purpose? Just, well, who knows? Some people say there is purpose. Some people say there is no purpose. And just don't get into these questions. Just live, live the best that you can. At one level, it might seem good. And most people are not very philosophical. So most people, in a sense, live like existentialists. They may, not, may never heard the word also existentialism. But okay, just don't bother about all these questions. Just live the way you are. However, we may, we may just live life without having any philosophy. But actually... Nobody lives without any philosophy. If we have never thought about philosophy, then we are living with an unthought philosophy. Unthought means we never thought about how we are living. So an unthought philosophy is a philosophy. <laughs> philosophy is the sophistry of foods. The sophistry is the misleading logic. So false arguments. So actually, every one of us, we all live, we don't just live for the present, we live for the future. Now, in a sense that, say, parents, even somebody is an existentialist, and they live in the, they, they, when they, if they are parents and they are taking care of the children, they want that the children grow up and have a bright future. Yes, they have to study in the present, work in the present, but we all live for something more than the present. So, when we just avoid philosophical questions, then what happens? It's not that we live without a philosophy. We gravitate toward the default philosophy of materialism. That means, what is here and now, what I see, that is what I live for. Now, materialism is the default philosophy of most people in the world. And the problem with materialism is that it makes life meaningless. How does it make life meaningless? Because within materialism, ultimately, death is going to come and going to destroy everything. And everything that we have worked for is going to be stripped away. And even before that, there are times when distress comes. And sometimes big distress comes. And then, anybody who faces huge distress, they soon have to 
question, what am I doing for? Why should I get all this distress? Why should I, if life is ultimately meaningless, why do I go through all this trouble? What is the point of it all? And when we live only for the present, see, living in the present is good, but living for the present is not good. We have to live for something bigger than the present. So, when Shiva Prabhupada was in the West, that was the time when, at one level, the hippies were very into drugs and they were very, uh, very degraded. But many of them were spiritual seekers. And they would dabble into different philosophies. So there were some prominent philosophers. There was one philosopher, Alberto Camus, he said that existence is miserable. Therefore, the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow. <laughs> wrote many, many books and his conclusion was, don't commit suicide today. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, live life, somehow try to create some, some meaning in life. So existentialism dodges all the big questions of life. But Srila Prabhupada, even from the early days, he was very, he was philosophic. Prabhupada, if he sees classes, he was not trying to entertain people by giving them some pep talks, some motivational talks. There was spiritual motivation that came when we understood the philosophy. There was encouragement and inspiration also came. But Prabhupada did not avoid philosophy. The Prabhupada was not non-philosophical in order to become popular. Prabhupada grounded all his teachings in philosophy. And he addressed tough questions. And if, now, as I travel across the world, I meet people from various traditions, the various Hindu groups, various Christian, various Muslim groups. I go to interfaith meetings. And each tradition may have its teachers. And some of these teachers are very good philosophers. But there is a huge gap between the philosophy of the, of the founder or the teacher and the philosophical understanding of the other followers. Most people, they don't even have answers to the basic questions of life. And they go in the traditional Judeo-Christian version of religion is that it's pray, pay, obey. You go to a church to pray and then you pay, give some donation, give some tithe and then obey. Do this, don't do this. And there is very, there is, you have some faith. Oh, there is God or Jesus came and Jesus saved you. He died for you. You accept him as your savior and you will be saved. Now, this is not to minimize Christianity. Every religion has this idea. Something similar. You just have faith and everything will be taken care of. So, now this is, this is not existentialism, of course. But it's something similar where the philosophical questions are dodged. Don't get into philosophy. But Prabhupada was not like that. Prabhupada... He, Prabhupada spoke philosophy in all his books. And Prabhupada spent a lot of time writing his books. His classes were philosophical. The idea is that not every one of us can be a philosopher. But every one of us can be grounded in a philosophical understanding of life. So when there is philosophy, this is what happens. Is every, every religion will give some rules. Do this, don't do this. I was at an interfaith meeting and there was a Christian priest who, who told about a survey they had done in Christianity. And among Christian youth, what is their idea of a priest? And he said, that, the one young man said, a priest is someone who is constantly worried that someone somewhere is having some fun. <laughs> <laughs> So, their idea is that, oh, people, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Now, there are so many rules. Now, yes, there are rules, but Prabhupada, Prabhupada explained explicitly to one of his, uh, one of the devotees doing college outreach, 
Prabhupada said the worst thing that you can do when you are sharing Krishna consciousness is present it as a set of rules. Prabhupada said, if you explain the philosophy, then people will be able to see rules as routes to a better life. And then when they see, okay, following these rules will make my life better. Then the rules don't become like an external imposition. They become an inner discipline. They become an inner discipline. We consciously So Prabhupada explained that there is material consciousness, there is spiritual consciousness. There is material pleasure, there is spiritual pleasure. Material pleasure is temporary. Spiritual pleasure lasts much more. It is fulfilling. And if we can raise our consciousness to spiritual level, we can experience so much more joy. So Prabhupada, he gave philosophy in a way that it could act as a map for our life journey. So the philosophy shows us these rules. Okay, do this and don't do this. Why? If you do these these things, then that will keep your consciousness stuck at the material level. And then you are deprived of spiritual life. If you do these things, your consciousness rises to the spiritual level. And then you can access more and more happiness. So Prabhupada addressed philosophy. And even in his morning walks, Prabhupada would play the devil's advocate. And as the devil's advocate, he would uh, he would play the role of atheist or a skeptic and ask his disciples to answer questions. And, and he would refute all their answers. And what did Prabhupada do? By this, Prabhupada trained. And Prabhupada, even when he was teaching philosophy, it was not like a stereotype. Once a devotee asked, uh, once Prabhupada in the morning walk asked the devotees, he said, why do you accept Krishna as God? And different devotees have different answers. You know, he has six opulences, he is all attractive, this, that. Who said, that's just your belief. And then the Prabhupada rejected all the answers. And finally Prabhupada said, because the Bhagavad Gita says Krishna is God. We all have to accept ultimately some authority for giving knowledge. And this is a divine revelation. And then Prabhupada went to another place. And again in the morning walk, he played the same devil's advocate. And there was one devotee who was there in this talk and can be there in this talk. He was just waiting. When will I get the chance to speak? All the other devotees were answering and Prabhupada was dismissing their answers. And then finally, Prabhupada, because the Bhagavad Gita says, Prabhupada said, why should I accept your Bhagavad Gita? <laughs> <laughs> and he was flummoxed. He didn't know what to say. And then, finally Prabhupada said that, when we chant Hare Krishna, we experience the ecstasy. That's why we accept Krishna as God. Now, which is the answer? Is it because it is the Bhagavad Gita or because of the experience? It depends on context. Now, in some context, we, we stress the authority, the, authority, the authority of the sources of knowledge from which we are drawing. In some cases, we focus on the experience that the process can give. It depends on whom we are talking with. So Prabhupada is resourceful in presenting philosophy. That's why you study Shri Prabhupada and sometimes you ask the same question, you will not answer the same question in the same way. Because you are looking at the person. And for him, just answering the question is not important. Addressing the questioner's need is important. So that was Prabhupada. He was a transcendentalist who equipped people to face life not by dodging life's big questions, but by giving philosophy in an accessible, understandable way. So that was Prabhupada. And then what is the third category? Utopianist. Utopianists are saying, oh, the future will be so wonderful. Now, we all need uh, some hope that the future will be brighter than the present. That's what inspires us to work, to strive. And among all living beings, we humans alone have the conscious capacity to recognize that the re reality is structured in such a way that we can trade the present from the future. It means that trade the present means that in the present there are some some things might be enjoyable for us. 
But if I forego these pleasures, I can get something better in the future. So that's the basis of all of education. That's the basis of so many of the things that we do in our life. So now animals may also prepare for the future. When uh, the winter starts coming, maybe some mm, the frogs burrow onto the earth, other animals do various things. But that is what their instincts tell them to do. The frog who is burrowing a hole for winter is not thinking. I have to dig into this ground and make a hole. I'd better be watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the frogs do. Now, we humans, we, we have a greater amount of free will and we can choose. We can choose to just indulge in the present or we can trade the present for the future. So, now this, this intelligence to know that, okay, if I forego something in the present, I can have something better in the future. This intelligence we human beings have. And that is something we can see even in our food. A cow is the same grass generation after generation after generation. Humans, we cook so many foods. Now we could just take the vegetables and fruits and eat it. That was some days. But we forego that pleasure so that we could cook something. And we need a few hours later. Some cooking takes one or two hours. Some foods it takes maybe a dozen hours. Some foods, not only we do cook, but we actually cultivate, we irrigate. We grow agriculture, so some of it for five, six months, so that we can get very good food. So we have this intelligence. So certainly, we all have the intelligence and the ability to work to create a better future. But utopianists are the people who believe that at the material level, there will be a future where life will be wonderful and all problems will be solved. So, there are different kinds of utopias. When communism was actually a utopia, communism was not just a political ideology, it was also actually, it had some spiritual appeal. Actually, spiritual means not that communism did not accept anything spiritual. Communism said God is the opium, religion is the opium of the masses, they rejected the idea of soul and God. But it appealed to the longing of the human spirit for a better future. They said that, oh, there are wealthy people who exploit the poor people. And we will destroy all the wealthy people, take all their wealth. And then everybody will have that wealth equally and everybody will be happy. Now, what happened eventually was that, as one social commentator said that, in communism, everyone is equal. But some people are more equal than others. <laughs> so that means what happened? Now who is going to redistribute wealth like this? Who is going to take wealth? There has to be a rule of class of administrators. And those administrators eventually became poor. So there were the rulers and the ruled. That dichotomy eventually got created. And it's a disastrous ideology. Communism promised a bright future. Now most of us... We know about the horrors of, say, the First World War, Second World War. Millions of people were killed. But actually in Russia and China, in USSR and China, a hundred million people were killed by the government socialism. Double the amount of people who were killed in the First World War and first World, Second World War combined. And communism was driven primarily by atheistic, atheistic utopia. That we remove God from the world, and essentially what happens? We, the state will become God. And the state will decide, you should have this much wealth, you should have this kind of house, you should have this. But the state became not a God, eventually it turned out to be the devil. Because at least it was one country fighting against another in the first world war, second world war. But in communism, it is the government itself killing people. Anybody who suspected, was killed. So, uh, when there is this utopianism, utopia at the material level. We will make some material changes and life will become wonderful. That, that utopia soon changes into a dystopia. Utopia is how wonderful the future is. Dystopia is how dreadful the future is. Nowadays, communism is, has lost much of its sheen. Although socialism is still very much appealing. There is the idea of the welfare state. 
but the problem with the idea of welfare state is that people soon run out of others money to spend <laughs> you take money from others how much money do you have eventually so life is tough and no amount of social engineering can actually uh, change the nature of reality life is tough and it's going to be tough now today there is not there is some hope for social engineering but now today's utopia is technology technology is so involved problem i was just a month or so ago in the bay area so in silicon valley and those places there is so much a remarkable advancement of technology but along with that there is a lot of unrealistic hype there is this idea that you know stephen hawking was a very prominent scientist and one of his uh, one of his last talks he said that you know that the way humanity has become violent we are killing each other we are destroying the other we are destroying our environment our only hope is that we advance technologically fast enough so that before we destroy the earth we have enough technological advancement to go to other planets and <laughs> 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 seriously he was this talk was calling that the whole world should increase the funds for space research so that before we destroy the earth we can go to other planets but then we'll go there and destroy those planets also <laughs> it is not that the earth is destroying itself it's humans who are destroying it so technology cannot change people internally technology is very useful shri prabhupad used technology called yukta vairagya used technology but technology can make things better spirituality can make people better technology can change the externals for the better spirituality will change the internals for the better ashla prabhupad talked about this Synth- synthesis is the synthesis when he talked about how the west is technologically advanced this in india is technologically and financially poor but india is spiritually advanced where the blind man and the lame man come together so prabhupad was not just a utopian realist you know the world is a tough place but if whatever material advancement we are doing along with that there is spiritual advancement then the material advancement may deal with material problems but other problems will come it is if we can cultivate a spiritual culture we can say spiritual knowledge <coughs> then each one of us at the very least can make our life better and we can help make others life better sometimes we can make a, influence a lot of people sometimes we influence a few people but shri prabhupad we can prove with this point shri prabhupad had this amazing potency to infuse confidence in anyone and everyone that they could become an instrument of krishna they could be empowered by krishna that they could do wonderful things and krishna would guide them so shri prabhupad early disciples prabhupad called him one day 1967 and said now i want to start the back to god in magazine i said prabhupad i have never done anything with a magazine till now except read it <laughs> how do i run a magazine and prabhupad said you just try krishna will guide you and prabhupad has such a personal connect with krishna that when prabhupad would say that devotees would feel that this krishna is really here and krishna will will guide us one of my friends is a traditional brahmana and he told me that you hari krishna is a god everything wrong <laughs> so i said what happened he said for radha you use a double honorific you say shrimati radha ram but for krishna you don't use any honorific no shri krishna no bhagwan krishna just krishna so i said that why do you respect radha so much and you don't respect krishna at all and it is not that we don't respect krishna prabhupad coined a whole word a whole phrase to describe krishna what is that the supreme personality of god that is translation of bhagavan but prabhupad while he emphasized the position of krishna prabhupad also wanted each one of us to feel that we have a personal relationship with krishna when prabhupad would talk about krishna 
Miracles are not against science. Miracles are about science. Why? Because we accept the laws of nature, but we accept that God is above the laws of nature. So God can suspend the laws of nature. How can Krishna lift a mountain when he lifted the Govardhan? So we ask, so how did Krishna find the center of gravity of Govardhan to put his finger over there and balance? <laughs> Krishna doesn't have to find the center of gravity because he is the source of gravity. <laughs> That there are laws of nature and we accept that God exists above the laws of nature. So we accept miracles. But actually, we don't just accept miracles. In Krishna consciousness, we don't just believe in miracles, we depend on miracles. You know, we see how Shri Prabhupada came to America all alone. Unless he had the faith at the age of 70, all alone, without any money, without any contacts, without any institutional support, he came because he had the faith in Krishna. And that, pres that presence of Krishna, each one of us, we can experience if we practice bhakti and seek Shri Prabhupada's blessings. Krishna is present in the hearts of each one of us. And Krishna loves every one of us. Krishna's love for us is not based on how good we are. Krishna's love for us is based on how good he is. It's, it's, he's just the all-loving parent of everyone. Surudam Sarva Bhutana. He's a loving, he loves everyone of us. And it is this personal connection with a loving divinity that some people might think is a utopia. But for a devotee, it becomes a reality. When we strive to practice bhakti, we may all go through some dry phases that we don't feel we connect with Krishna. We don't feel the presence of Krishna. But we start practicing bhakti. We keep practicing bhakti religiously. Krishna starts becoming more and more of an active presence. We start seeing Krishna acting in our hearts, in our world, in the world around us. And thus, our devotee becomes empowered. Srila Prabhupada is empowered by Krishna not just to do wonderful things himself. Srila Prabhupada is empowered to empower others to do wonderful things. Shri Prabhupada was asked once, several times actually, twice he was asked you know, oh, that who will be your successor? Traditionally, if there is one guru, he appoints successor. And Prabhupada gave different answers at different times. One time he said, whoever wants to be. So what do you mean whoever wants to be? If Prabhupada wanted you know, all of the whoever that they fight and they have captured, not like that. Prabhupada said that this is what the spiritual master gives to his disciple is something very significant. Prabhupada said that I inherited the legacy of my spiritual master. Now if you see, the Gaudiya Mutt was at one time a flourishing institute. There are 64 temples in India, three centers outside India, one in Burma, one in Germany, one in UK. But when Prabhupada started outreach, he had nothing. He did not get anything from the Gaudiya Mutt. Then what did Prabhupada actually get from his spiritual master as a legacy? So that was the desire to serve Krishna, the desire to share Krishna. And that is the legacy of the spiritual master to disciple. That is the legacy of Krishna through the bhakti tradition to all bhakti practitioners. Prabhupada internalized that desire to serve and share Krishna. And through that desire, wonderful fruits came. Through that desire, over 70 books came. Through that desire, 108 temples all over the world came. Through that desire, thousands and thousands of souls were attracted to Krishna, to dedicate their lives to Krishna. 
and to experience divine enrichment through the process of bhakti in their own lives, in this life, and beyond this life. So, in the Prabhupada's, that legacy is available for each one of us. We may, we don't have to be affiliated with an institution in the sense of having a position in an institution. Prabhupada's legacy is available for everybody. If we can internalize this desire to serve and share Krishna, then we all can be empowered. Now, how much? But Krishna knows. We all can, if we try to serve Krishna a little bit more, we sit on Krishna to a few friends, maybe uh, conduct ourselves in a way more gently, more sensitively, more, more spiritually, and people become attracted. We all can do good to the world. We all can be empowered by Krishna to do good in our own heart and to do good in the world. And how much good can we do? If we become an instrument for Krishna and Shri Prabhupada, there is no limit to how much we can do. How much good we can do if we pull our act together and we try to serve Krishna. Discovering how much good we can do, that is our life's biggest adventure. People want adventures and they go skiing on top of uh, skiing or they go hiking or they do extreme sports. Yeah, all those are adventure. But that's separate from the life. Life itself can become an adventure if we try to become an instrument for Krishna. And Krishna can do extraordinary good in the world and in our hearts. And that is the lasting legacy that Srila Prabhupada has enriched each one of us with. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this theme of how Srila Prabhupada has, what is under appreciating Srila Prabhupada's mercy. Talk about three different categories of people. Who were they? Traditionalists, existentialists, and, and uh, utopianists. So traditional life is tough and we all need resources to deal with life's tough things. The traditionalists think that the past has all the answers. Now, Prabhupada taught the tradition, but Prabhupada was not just a trans traditionalist. He was a transcendentalist. So, traditionalists are, they just have the literal answers from the past is applied. It's like, use the same formula which helped a plant grow in India to grow in America. It did not work. So, Prabhupada did not just bring in traditional ideas of purity and impurity and make people feel impure. Prabhupada accepted it. Prabhupada learned in America. Prabhupada was not infatuated with America, but he wanted to understand America so that he could share in America. In Krishna consciousness. And he was resourceful in making everyone feel valued and cared for. And then he gave them the bhakti prescription by which he attracted them to him. Existentialists are those who just live in the present and don't think about any big questions of life. Now, we can't live in the present, especially when the present is just miserable, as when you are sick. Sick, we have to live for something bigger than the present. So, there are many, many, there may be many spiritual teachers, and many of them may have their philosophies. But often there's a gap between the philosophical level of, big gap in the philosophical level of their followers and their own philosophies. Because they, in order to be popular, they often just speak some entertainment and don't teach philosophy. Prabhupada, was always philosophical and still he reached a large number of people. And the philosophy that Prabhupada gave was not abstract. It was philosophy to help people see how to navigate their life journey. The rules that Prabhupada gave that they did not feel like depriving or restrictive because he showed that rules are routes to a better life. And in this way, when we have philosophical understanding, then we voluntarily practice the things. See, then we say no to the things which keep us in material consciousness, and we say yes to the things that lead us to spiritual consciousness. And then Prabhupada was not just a utopianist. So this, uh, we all want that the future be brighter than the present, and we work for that. That's the basis. That's the difference between human life and animal life. Uh, one significant difference. But those who think that the future, the material level, will be wonderful, they are. They are, they are in illusion. Communism tried that and it actually created a horrendous dystopia. And technology is trying that, but technology is actually 
leading to people becoming more fragmented, alienated, lonely, and we are destroying the planet with all the advanced technology. So, Prabhupada said that, Prabhupada explained how we could have technology and spirituality come together. The East-West synthesis. Technology can make things better, spirituality can make people better. So, Prabhupada is a transcendentalist for whom Krishna was not an abstract remote divinity, but a living, loving person who was with him. And Prabhupada could give that conviction that Krishna is with each one of us who has followed us. And Prabhupada is empowered by Krishna, not just to himself do wonderful things, but to empower others to do wonderful things. The legacy that Shri Prabhupada got from his spiritual master was that he got, uh, that the desire to serve and share Krishna. And that legacy is available to each one of us. And it is, we try to serve and share Krishna with others, just trying to do a little more than what we can. Then, instead of being obsessed with our problems, we should start discovering that each one of us can do good to others and to ourselves. And discovering how much good we can do instead of complaining how bad life is. Discovering how much good we can do is life's biggest adventure. And you can pray to Shri Prabhupada that he give us his mercy so that we all can join him in this divine adventure of relishing and sharing Krishna Bhakti. Shri Prabhupada ki Shri Prabhupada Tirubha Mahamahotsal ki Any question? Are there any questions or comments? Philosophy can't explain everything. We need faith. Yes, that is true. There is reasonable faith and there is blind faith. Faith is sometimes the word faith or belief has negative connotations nowadays. They say, oh, science deals with facts. Religion deals with faith. But it's not that simple. Science also deals with faith. When scientists observe nature, they have faith that there is some order in nature. When Newton saw that fruit falling, the apple had gone to this, had gone to the Cambridge University to speak on science and spirituality. So we passed by that same tree. So that tree is like a pilgrimage place for scientists. <laughs> <laughs> so now, when Newton saw that fruit falling, now he, he, he asked that question, what made this fruit fall? When he asked that question, that means he had faith that fruit don't just fall out randomly. There is some order. So, even science requires faith. When some observations don't make sense, scientists don't think, oh, reality doesn't make sense. And there is some, some other theory, some other law, some other principle which will help us to make sense. So, scientific advancement is based on the faith that nature operates in an orderly way. So every area of knowledge requires faith. But the idea is the faith is incremental. That means with respect to, as you said, the realization of the Acharyas about, say, the kind of ecstasy that we experience when we love Krishna. Yes, that's a matter of faith. But where we are, we have enough intellectual resources to make sense of the condition we are in and where we can take steps forward. So you could say that reason reason and faith are two different things. So reason is like a flashlight, which shows us one step ahead. Faith is the, is the acceptance that even if I can't see the road ahead, this road will take me to a good place. 
So we can't see the full road ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Definitely we need to wait for that. <laughs> but if I can't see even one step ahead and I'm told to move in a particular direction, then that will be blind faith. Okay? Yes, please. Okay. What small things can we include in our day to day life to experience Krishna more? Very draining when we work all day, especially with devices. We become, we, the more we interact with machines, the more we also become mechanical. And then it's very difficult to be personal. And Bhakti is a personal relationship with Krishna. So we are, it's, it's difficult. We are not even personal with people around us. So what to speak of the per person who is beyond us? How do we, how can we be personal with them? It's tough. No doubt about it. And two, three things. The basic principle is what Rupa Goswami in Ujjwal Nilamani talk calls as the Uddipan. Uh, Ujjwal Nilamani is the advanced book after after Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu. That's Uddipan for me now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm going over time. <laughs> okay. So, what is uh, audible? Yeah. So, what he says, Uddipan is that just as all of us have certain, say, sensual stimuli that agitate us. There's somebody who is who is very much into cricket. Just read some news about cricket match, immediately they are getting agitated. Now, whenever I give lectures in America, often the college organizers tell me, college program organizers, they tell me, don't talk about cricket. <laughs> they say, here in Americans, when they hear about cricket, they think about an insect, not a game. <laughs> so, cricket might not agitate people in America. Maybe baseball, or basketball, or whatever else. Mm -hmm. So, each of us has certain sensual stimuli that agitate us. And other sensual stimuli don't agitate us. Because we are all individuals, we have our individual conditionings or, and our past experiences, experiences. The same principle applies to our spirituality also. Each of us has certain spiritual stimuli, which, which we won't use the word agitate, but which attract us toward Krishna. For someone, it might be music, and not just music. It might be a particular, maybe a particular song, or a particular kirtan, a particular dhun, a particular tune, or it might, for somebody, it might be darshan of the Lord, and maybe a particular picture of the Lord. For somebody, it might be a particular book. Some devotees just love Bhagavad Gita. Some may love Chaitanya Charita Amrita. So for somebody, it might be a particular speaker. Or somebody with a particular subject. I, I love this process. I just want to finish this process. So we could say that there is a circle of bhakti. And there is a circle of what we like. We find the intersection of the two. The two are not wholly overlapping. But they are not wholly uh, wholly disjoint also. So we find where they intersect. And we do that activity more. That can be our anchor in bhakti. So there are things which we may not like to do so much. And if they are a part of the bhakti sadhana, we have to do them. But doing them will drain us. So life, as I started by saying, life is tough. So, we all have many battles to fight in life. And sometimes, we may start seeing our spirituality as one more battle to fight amidst our embattled life. <laughs> and if you have that vision, you say, I have it enough now, I don't want to do this. <laughs> but, but actually, our spirituality is meant to be like a resource that empowers us to fight the battles of life. Yes, spirituality is also a battle, but it's not primarily meant to be another battle. It's meant to be a resource that gives us inner strength, inner stability, by which we can better fight the battles of life. So for us to feel that way, if we are existing primarily in that circle of things that we don't really like, 
then it will be a drain. Then you'll feel this one more battery to connect. But if we exist in the, if we function primarily in that overlapping circle, overlap also circles, where we're doing some devotional activities which also stimulate us, which also energize us. Then, then the things that stimulate us in bhakti, they are called as uddipan. Uddipan is a spiritual stimulus. So each one of us has to find out our particular spiritual stimulus, our particular uddipan, and keep those readily accessible. So if you like particular darshan of the deity, then keep that in your phone or keep a picture ready. When the mind feels agitated, look at that, pray to that particular manifestation of Krishna. If you like a particular kirtan, Keep that accessible, hear that. And that way, we will be able to keep ourselves strengthened. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So another question which I have, yeah. Last question. Living in the present is good, but living for the present is not good. So, can you please okay. so living in the present is good, but living for the present is not good. What it means is that see, the present is the only resource we have to do anything worthwhile. We can't do anything in the past. The past is already gone. We can't do anything in the future. The future has not yet come. So in that sense, the only resource we have for doing anything is the present. That in that sense, we need to live in the present. But what do we do in the present? In the present, we do things which contribute to something bigger. So, if see, there is some people, the other philosophical or non-philosophical way of living at it is live for the moment. Whatever is enjoyable now, just do that. And actually, if we simply start doing whatever we like, no, I talked earlier about doing what we like. But not just doing what we like. Doing what we like is also good for us. But if we start doing whatever we like, whatever feels good in the moment, I start doing that. The result of that is, if we keep doing whatever we like, we end up disliking ourselves. Now, if I just keep eating whatever feels good to me, then eventually I'll become sick, I'll become obese. And I started disliking myself. Like somebody just spends time, you know, okay, this, whatever feel I feel, I look at look at the social media, look at that video, look at that site, look at that. He just keeps hours and hours and after that, what happens? For people who just live without any principles, who live only for pleasure. To the world, they might appear to be enjoying a lot, but actually they have a lot of self-loathing. And not doing anything worthwhile in that way. They, they, people who just live for the moment all the time, they soon start losing self respect. They start losing self esteem. Because they say, you know, I'm not doing anything worthwhile in life. Just chasing one pleasure, another pleasure, another pleasure. So we need to live for something bigger than just the pleasure of the moment. And then we create a better future for ourselves. So, what is the live for, don't live for the present. So a devotee ultimately lives for Krishna. A student may, if the student wants to live for the moment, they would just enjoy in the in the campus. There's so many things to enjoy. But if they're not living, they're living for a career. Then they're living for something bigger. Then they can build a career. Uh, so a devotee lives for Krishna. That means I live in the present, but in the present, how best can I serve Krishna? So a devotee's purpose is to please Krishna, to connect with Krishna and to go closer to Krishna. And the present is our tool for that. So Prabhupada was very grounded in the sense that whatever resources Prabhupada had, Prabhupada was using that. Prabhupada was not uh, hankering, oh, if I had more followers, if I had more wealth, I could do so much more. Yes, Prabhupada was always, if he got more, he used that. But Prabhupada was constantly diligently serving Krishna with what he had. So that means we live, we use the present to serve Krishna. That's how we live in the present, but not for the present. Okay. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki.
गौर भक्त बिंद की गौर प्रमाण गौर 